I make straight A's and I got a 32 on the ACT and I'm in eighth grade. So most people would just label me an academic. But I also run cross country and I tumble and I cook and I crochet and I play piano. I am a storyteller. I tell stories through art and writing and acting and music. We're all just stories in the end, so why not make it a good one? I want to tell you my entire story. was planted in all of us that we, we really felt like the whole child was not being addressed. With a student having access to access to themselves first and then having trust enough in themselves to say, hey world, this is me. Digital portfolios gives them an outlet to um, showcase who they are. In Madison City Schools, we've dedicated the last couple of years to experimenting with digital portfolios, iterating with each school experience to improve the process. We've created free and highly shareable tools that should get you off the ground in this skyscraping pursuit. We hope we've made it easy for you to follow suit with what will work best for your students, teachers, and families. The public Google Drive folder link is in the description of this video. We want you to use our presentations, lesson plans, and handouts, but we also hope you take our ideas and remix them in new and exciting ways, change them, improve the process, and of course, add your own characters to the story to build your own brand of adventure. Digital portfolios to me are an opportunity for the kids, uh, the students, and it's, it's twofold. It's part of the process and the product. Uh, the product to me is more self-explanatory. It's a culmination of all the successes that that student has throughout their time in high school. It's a um, kind of a graphic organizer, but it's interactive and it's in-depth and it, it shows their strengths and their successes. Uh, equally important to me is the process, which is during their time in high school to constantly collect, to evaluate, to objectively look at their successes, but also their weaknesses. Um, where am I doing really well? Where can I get stronger? Uh, where do I need to round myself out so that I'm a college and career ready? Where do I need to be more effective, more efficient? Um, and it's that process that helps the product be stronger come the very end um, as we present ourselves to the world. It's, it's a huge endeavor to take alone, so I recommend starting with a team. Um, can you do it alone? Of course you can. But starting with a team, partnering with um, library media specialists, with your colleagues, with your grade level, with partners from central office, anybody at school level who's interested in partnering is probably the best way to start. And I would say you start with the end in mind. What is your goal? Think about that. And you start with brainstorming ideas. Start with looking at what you need to accomplish. Look at your students' passions, at the students' um, level of comfort, not with just technology, but academically also in their personal lives as well. Just kind of look at all of the aspects of their life and um, see how that fits in your goals as well. The reason that we wanted to integrate digital portfolios into our curriculum, into our courses, is because the digital portfolio is the perfect opportunity for students to showcase themselves and to demonstrate that they are not one-dimensional. They go so far beyond what they are currently doing in one particular class or in their high school. And even in a classroom, you still sometimes don't know your kids' passions. But if you get in and you dig down and you start working with them with digital portfolios, you are able to find out their likes, their dislikes. I mean, obviously, they're learning skills beyond something that you can possibly learn in a, in a textbook. Even colleges are starting to realize, hey, ACT scores and grades and essays aren't really giving us the bright picture about the child that we want. 
And so high schools start, got on and started looking at digital portfolios as a way to portray the whole child. It's more uh, hands-on um, creativity. They're learning um, navigation skills. They're learning how to do multimedia design. And as we were going through that process, we realized this is really a great process for every child to go through. It's very reflective. It causes them to be a very deep thinker, and it really portrays the whole child and not just very specific academic strengths. Well, it's really fun, and I enjoy it. And I, I don't want to be like hit away. I want people to know who I am. In the beginning, when we first started with those classes, they really didn't know who they didn't know about themselves even. You know, they were stuck, and then looking at that big piece of paper, trying to figure out what to put down about themselves. And then when they started writing down just little things, and we were working with them on who they were, what they liked, what they didn't like, you started to see their personalities come out, their passions come out, that I didn't even... You know, you didn't even, I didn't know. Encouraging the students to capture their greatest areas of interest, whether that be academics or athletics, English, engineering, community service, it didn't matter. We wanted them to capture their passion. It was also a reflective process for them to think about the things that they were proud of because, I mean, think about how many kids when they're like, oh, I don't even know what I am proud of. And then it was a chance to prompt them to think about things that they normally don't ever think about or a way for them to focus and see things that are totally awesome that they didn't necessarily categorize as awesome. So it's something that I can put everything about me on um, and I can organize it in such a way that I can see all the connections between all the things that I do. And um, it actually has helped me think of, you know, what everything means to me in a specific way. Um, like how the how I do art connects to how I write and then I can see themes there of things that I believe and things that I dream and it's cool because it's all in one place and then I can see it I don't just think it all of a sudden the world opens up to them in so many different avenues and so many different possibilities and who they thought they were now becomes this bigger picture of what they can now be. I think the purpose of a digital portfolio is really to showcase the individual. So we're living in a really cool time where we are connected um, through the internet, right? But a lot of times people aren't using it to its full potential. Like it's really easy to make a Facebook profile, it's really easy to use Snapchat, Instagram, all of these social media spaces, but people aren't really capitalizing on the possibility to design a space online to continually upgrade and show your growth as a human being and not just within how you're doing with grades or how well you know a content of a subject, but also who you are as an individual, what you like, what you're good at. Um, and it's a way to showcase multiple pieces of media, not just photos, not just video, um, not just art. I think one of the concerns is always, uh, how does this relate to people who are not uh, product oriented, who are not artistic, or people who produce a, a product or a project that they want to show. And I think that becomes where this continues to be uh, an interesting challenge, is I think it offers opportunities for people who write, uh, people who are into math and engineering, to really continue to pave the way and to find opportunities to show off their strengths. I mean, you can literally, the list is endless because the tools are continually being updated. And so it's a space where if you start with an eight-year-old, um, when they're 10 years later, when they're 18, it can constantly be updated. And so we have this digital journey. Any initiative in education should have a conceptual through line that allows teachers and students at any grade level to latch on. We believe we've whittled this process down to its absolute essential form. No matter what age group we're working with, our mantra is always the same. Show, then reflect. I think, just like a teacher going through national boards, one of the things people really likes, like about that is that it causes you to be extremely reflective. What did I do? What do I need to change? What went well? What didn't go well? What are my goals for the future? I think we don't ask our students to think like this very often, and I think a digital portfolio is a platform 
that requires them to really parse through who they are as a person and go, this is what I want to put forward. Maybe I put forward something to show you how I learned, but maybe I also am putting something forward to show you what I accomplished. But they can do that in many avenues. They can do it with their passions, with their academics, with their weaknesses, and it's really great because I think not only can it encapsulate them and show somebody else who they are, but I think it helps them realize who they are. Um, I like how you can edit it yourself and it's like it kind of becomes you. It's like nobody's really telling you what to do. It's like you describe it yourself. It's a self-discovery for them, for this digital portfolio, and for them to think in terms of big picture and years later. Because um, they all think about college, you know, or not college, or what they're going to do after high school. But for them to think about that this is going to be something that I'm going to continually add to, and that they know that it's something that they can change, and that's something that's going to be fluid, and something for them to even look back on and see how far they've come. Uh, starting digital portfolios here was... Uh, it was a challenge, but it was a, a unique challenge and it was a good challenge. Um, what I talked about earlier, the process of, of collecting things along the way and objectively looking at your strengths and weaknesses and successes, we didn't necessarily have that opportunity. Uh, it's like trying to remember back over the last three or four years and, and think of all the things you did well that you could have done better. Uh, instead, we focused mainly on paving the groundwork, um, deciding what does this look like? What is it going to look like for everyone who comes after us? You have to learn to trust yourself and trust the process. And processes are never, they're not fun, you know? We don't get iron without putting it through some fire. Yeah. You know, so it takes some, it takes some pain and some experience and some journeying to finally figure out, you know, where you are. So it's not about the product, you know? It's, it really is the journey and what you discover on the way. I think that's the cool thing, like digital portfolios. Oh my gosh, that's life. I think it's something that should I should definitely plan into every month, if not twice a month. And because if it's a self-reflection process, and that's the whole purpose of education, is self-reflection, even as adults, it's, it's just gotta be constant self-reflection. What did I do well? What can I do better on? We have to provide that time for them. And it's something that they enjoy doing. So as they self-reflect and they can still love what they're doing, I think it's something that needs to happen more often. For me and for the students who participated, it was very much about the challenge of, of seeing what this could be or what it would be. Um, and so uh, we learned a lot. Um, but and mainly it was during that time that we realized how important the process was of, of approaching this along the way instead of waiting till the very end. It's not a project at the very end, it's a process that you approach throughout the entire time. As they get to their senior year, having a link to that portfolio with that resume, with all of their, um, their best projects, their best works, um, those, those dynamic elements that they have embedded in their digital portfolios, it, it gives a, a, a broader, more dynamic um, um, characterization of who they really are right. instead of just a name with some accolades on a piece of paper. For our kids, it's like, um, you know, the old resume, but it's in full living color. And so the kids get to go in and not necessarily for not necessarily for a job even, but to just show their teachers, coaches, counselors, um, family who they are, uh, just in general. And it's not just a piece of paper. It's not just an online resume. This is an opportunity for our students to reflect on and demonstrate how their pursuit of their passion, whatever it may be, has not only benefited them, but it has also benefited or contributed to their school, their community, and for many of our students, the world. We did not start with technology, believe it or not. You would think digital portfolios, we jump straight on the computers and get started, but we do not. We start with pre-planning. There's a lot of brainstorming and thinking and looking. And then we go into phase one that involves students kind of taking themselves apart as, as humans and they look at their personality, at their passions that they're absolutely excited about. We believe that for new and worthy ideas in education to actually spread, we educators have to share everything with each other. This film is about sharing our experiences, 
but it's really only half the story. To get started, you're going to need real, usable resources. As mentioned earlier, in the description of this video, you'll find a link to a public Google Drive folder containing every single resource we've generated along the way. Or just type in tinyurl.com slash digitalportfolios dash whole story. The folder is organized into seven primary phases and an additional folder called supplemental resources. To help remember the phases, each one of them starts with the letter S. To begin, let's have a look at phase one entitled start. And with digital portfolios and what we're going to do with you guys for the next four days, we're trying to bring all of that back into school um, and kind of mix the worlds of school and your life together. Before we can put students on the path to caring about and getting the most out of digital portfolios, we have to start with purposefully considering what it means to be a global citizen. We believe that as early in life as possible, each of our students needs to be put in a variety of situations to contemplate the modern connected world and their place in it. Call it digital citizenship if you wish. We just call it citizenship. There is no separation anymore for our students. The start phase usually lasts between one and two hours, and it's much more than an introduction. It's the spark, the activation. It's the beginning of a new way of thinking for most of our students, and it needs to be exciting. As often as possible, we try to reserve a cafeteria or other large space with an AV setup. We treat it like a pep rally, sort of, and we keep the energy high. All that money. Reason. I think we should stop there. That is enough of a definition. A reason. There's a reason for it, right? The Google Drive folder we've shared includes our basic intro presentation. We urge you to make a copy of it and modify it to fit your needs and your learners but the gist is in there. In it, we provide the backbone to understand the what, how, and why of digital portfolios. We also think it's a great time for students to consider Bloom's taxonomy. Since digital portfolios are so creation and reflection based, it's important that our students understand the incoming philosophies that we as educators are using to drive the train. After the introduction to the concept of digital portfolios, but before students actually see an example of one, we give them a brainstorm sheet on which they explore independently what they can use a portfolio for and who their audience may be. Then we tell them to Google themselves. This is always a lot of fun and many students have never done it before, believe it or not. And many find that they have a digital footprint that they were not aware of. Googling themselves opens the pathways to understanding the depth of purpose in creating a digital portfolio. Then once they've done that, we share examples of exemplary digital portfolios from students who have come before them. And whenever possible, we actually bring a high school student with us to give a testimonial about their process. Mine isn't finished, but you want to put in there all the things that you've succeeded in. Whether or not it's your classes, maybe at school you um, tutored somebody, and people love to see that. Um, and my last thing is leadership. And this is one of, I think, the most important things, is I picked a trait about myself that I know people out in the world um, like and they want to be part of their college or part of their business. Then the students flip the brainstorm sheet over and answer the same questions again, this time attempting to dig a little bit deeper into the potential benefits. After a short break, the students are then handed a concept map on which they explore their passions, both things that excite them and infuriate them, their weaknesses and struggles, and of course their strengths. We then guide them through exploring their self-expression modes. Every student is different, and they need to take the time to consider how they best express themselves and their ideas over time as they develop a digital portfolio. We've included two examples for different age groups in the Drive folder. Use them as is, or use them as an inspiration to build your own. Finally, we assign them homework, really simple homework. The students are asked to sit quietly in their room at night without a device, simply reflecting on their world and their place in it, and ultimately how a digital portfolio may help them in their journey through life. The students turn in their graphic organizers to be used again later in phase two. Remember, phase one sets the tone. Keep it light, energetic, and exciting. Don't try to cover everything, just get them pumped for where they're headed. 
one thing that stood out to me was that I got to know myself a little better because I got to, you know, I had to really dig down deeper and, you know, think about what made me unique and so I got to learn a little bit more about myself in the process. It is our opinion that the next phase called self is the most important step in this process. Though there are not yet computers involved, this phase lays the foundation for the success of the following phases. Students focus on their own identity. They begin by revisiting and improving their concept maps from the start phase. They hone in on what is really important to them and begin thinking about designing the basic elements of the web page. This stage works best when students brainstorm ideas in small groups guided by adult mentors. For this phase, we highly recommend maximizing the number of adults in the room. Brainstorming progresses from small group to a whole group share session, then back to small groups. During this process, students are encouraged to look at each other's ideas, piggyback if needed, add or subtract while categorizing their identity that will be represented on the website. Students use a handout with chess drawers to organize their thought process and collect supportive evidence inside each drawer representing the category. These categories later become the navigation menu on each student's website. While there are some non-negotiable categories for us, such as home, about me, my learning, and up till now, students have a chance to explore their passions and add their own unique categories. Younger students will likely need a simplified graphic organizer with fewer options to keep them focused. Home, my passions, and my learning. We've included that graphic organizer in the folder as well. Whether you use our graphic organizers or make your own, you should know that we have had a lot of success with the drawer idea to aid students in the giant task of categorizing the complexity of their identities. At this point, students begin to understand that branding is just as important for an individual as it is for a successful company. It is the secret weapon that creates an image of you and shapes people's perceptions of your identity. They realize that branding one's identity involves self-reflection, hard work, good design, and many other aspects. What is your label? Who are you? These are the questions students ponder as they explore identity. They realize that artifacts such as videos, photos, artwork, sound files, or digital projects can help them tell their story and share their identity with the world. I feel that it could be really good to just show off who you are. Like for example, I'm in I'm extremely dedicated to music. So I people don't really ask me about that. So I feel it's good to just show off the fact that I feel I do really good at music and I feel others should know about it. To kick off the structure phase, we revisit students' concept maps, drawers, and labels for fine-tuning, usually around 20 minutes. We then delve deep into the topic of stereotyping, what it means, and the power of taking control of their identity by labeling themselves and making it public. Through sharing a few examples from other students' live portfolios and our own personal labels, students are given time to construct their own labels. Essentially, they are asked to sum themselves up in six words or less. We let students know that this label will change as they grow. We are not static. We often refer to portfolios as having a twofold agenda. One is that it provides a vehicle for you to tell the world who you are now. The other is what we refer to as a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you focus on your passions and give them the attention they need, you will make them happen. It is crucial that students have this mindset as they move forward. Before we move further, it is important to mention that there are many website creation platforms. Depending on the platform you choose, from one such as Wix that provides a lot of creative freedom, to Google Sites which provides four to five simple themes, students start by choosing a layout to build the foundational look of their website. Students are then encouraged to discuss their layout choice with an adult to see if it fits their theme and product choices. It is important here to consider what level of creative freedom is appropriate for the age group you are working with. To keep the main focus, the main focus, work to make sure you find a program that offers the right level of design freedom. During this structure phase, we discuss the principles of design including color, 
theme and balance, and we discuss professionalism, font choice, and overall aesthetics. We also focus heavily on how students can locate images that are copyright free and of good quality, especially by revealing and explaining the tools menu of Google Images. Next, we give students a device and time to generate the backbone of the website, the navigation bar, by transferring the titles from drawers on their organizer to the website's main pages. Once the students have created the navigational backbone, they then begin to curate their artifacts and reflections for their home page and one other page they feel passionate about, all the while focusing on their central theme and design features. By the end of this phase, we hope that students have the basics in order to work on the rest of the pages independently until the next meeting. Students are again encouraged to keep finding and storing artifacts in a central location so that they can be retrieved easily during the next phase. For me, it's kind of cool because I can put everything that I do in one place and it's like telling my entire story in one place and I can share it with whoever I want to. So if I show somebody my art, I can not only show them like my art, but I can also just flip over and show them some of my writing. And I think that's cool because I don't just do art and I don't just do writing, I do acting and I'm interested in books. So I have a little book blog on there. So it's something that I can put everything about me on. By phase four, called SOAR, your students are going to be ready to be set free for a while. Most of them will have found a path by now. They just need time to walk down it. With their backbones built, it's time to start adding some real content. This phase could last a day or a month. We've tried to keep it flexible to fit everyone's needs. However long it takes, give your students time to do what they know they need to do next and work to keep the forum as open as possible. Your students are gonna to wanna to bounce ideas off of each other and you and probably people outside of your room. This may not be a quiet time. That's why it's called SOAR. Let them fly the way they need to. We've included a simple Google Doc that we recommend projecting for your students during this phase. It includes some simple reminders and checkpoints which should allow your students to self-direct. It all started to come together. Like at first I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. And then everything just came together in the end and it just keeps on getting better and progressing and everything. Systems check is one of my most favorite phases where the training wheels finally fall off. Students begin feeling like they have enough confidence and understanding of the entire process to move forward without holding hands. While it is beautiful to watch students soar, a systems check is critical during this phase. It ensures quality and helps students be proud of their work. We remind students that simple and clean design is always best. During systems check, we encourage students to make sure they have all necessary items in their portfolio to paint a full picture of their identity. Name, navigation bar, important pages filled with high quality digital artifacts, place for reflection are some of the highlights of this phase. Throughout this phase, the focus is on quality, reflection, and student identity, including label and brand being visible every step of the way. We help students dig deeper into graphic design of their website, looking at background, color scheme, fonts, and organization. Some students advance faster than others, running into more complicated design problems. The lessons learned during this phase are priceless, as they involve solving real-life problems and addressing unpredictable challenges. Students realize that no one has all the answers, not even adults. They partner and collaborate with each other for mutual success. They fail and learn from mistakes. As a result, students produce a real-world product that is always evolving, just as they are throughout their school journey and beyond. It takes time, in my opinion, because like how, how it went with me was I didn't really know how to start because I didn't know how to like um, group everything and I had all these ideas but they didn't all fit into like one category so I really had to think about what kinds of things I love to do and see if I could put that into a category and then go from there. Steal like an artist. One of the biggest misconceptions about artistry is that it is created purely devoid of outside influence. That creativity, or good ideas, spring from a closed source inside you, assuming you are so lucky to be a creative, that is. 
bringing students through a critique phase to not only steal worthwhile ideas from their peers, but to also offer respectful advice is an invaluable step that reveals the true nature of creativity, that it is in all of us, and it is improved through partnering and collaboration. Just for a little while, it is necessary not to soar solo, but to depend on the airstream and support of the flock to accomplish a goal. During the critique, students are asked to present their unfinished portfolios to other students and to focus on providing and listening to critique on design elements such as theme, color, and balance. They are also asked to take a look at the content and reflections for appropriateness and relevance. To further the collaborative atmosphere, we then gather together as a whole group to share out the strengths and weaknesses that they have found in their own portfolios. From there, they continue to work and improve their own portfolios, but hopefully have learned the value of partnering and collaboration. The seventh and final phase is called share. You and your students may not get to this phase in its full glory. It depends on the age of your students. Ultimately, we believe that high school students should be working to make their portfolios completely public. We've seen huge benefits to students publishing their portfolios to the world. Students can use them to get internships, paying jobs, scholarships to college or trade schools, but they can also find partners in the world. Real partners, the kind that easily convert into amazing new opportunities early in life. But if your students are too young to publish to the world, this phase is a great time to find some sort of authentic audience. What if the students publish their portfolios but password protect them? Then, the students' family members, peers, etc. can see their best work and reflections curated into their portfolio. If you're using something like Seesaw or Class Dojo, the share phase has probably been ongoing since its inception. I found three rectangles. I found... If you're using a diverse set of web development interfaces like Wix, Weebly, or Google Sites, or others, you'll need some way to collect data and those web addresses. So we partnered with Patel Technologies in Huntsville to build a portfolio database. So I think that first phone call was about the challenge of this, what you're trying to do with the information you have in all the players in the game. It was to help collaborative people with a common mission organize information that will be updated. And then subsequently, that's for people who are new to the program, can come back and search through. We highly recommend contacting Patel Technologies to get your own instance of the custom portfolio database. With this database system, you can collect areas of interest as well as URLs for each student in your district. This allows two really great benefits. First, it allows students to search for and find inspiration for their own portfolios. For instance, if a rising ninth grader comes up to high school and then searches for art and video in the database, she'll find lots of other students who've already built a portfolio based around similar interests. Second, the database allows really great analysis of passion-based data for your school system. Using this database, we can now see trends in passions and interests that we otherwise would never see. I guess it could alter your, your teaching methods. Right? It could alter your view of how to reach these kids if you're struggling to connect. If you find the areas of interest are scattered, you probably have a challenge in front of you, but you look for some commonality between them. And fortunately, with some of the statistics, we can, with portfolio statistics, you can look at the primary and secondary and third level of areas of interest. And so you may not have everyone on the first level, but maybe you get 90% at the first and second level. This type of data can provide hugely meaningful insights for decision making. What if one high school has a high percentage of students who identify as artists, while the other high school has very little? What conclusions might we draw as leaders? How can this information help us in ways that traditional metrics could never? We're very excited about this part of the portfolio process, as it seeks to tie together leadership and decision making with the passions of your students. It's simple. The student just uses his network username and password to log in. He clicks New Entry, then Add Portfolio. He then fills out a few basic fields and chooses his top three areas of interest. 
Finally, he copies and pastes the URL of his portfolio into that field. Then he just clicks Save Portfolio. Now that student can change his portfolio all he wants, but his URL will always stay the same. This allows his portfolio to dynamically live and breathe while still being recorded in the system's database. Working with Madison City Schools on the initial design of the digital portfolio built on Curious, um, now it allows us to rapidly clone that for a new instance, for a new school system, which will start empty. But once we integrate the new user base, whether it's through the Microsoft LDAP authentication process or standing up a whole new username login system, uh, password login system, that can then be populated. And the framework or the digital portfolio will appear the same, but the data is different between the school systems. And they're independent, so they're two instances of the same framework. Finally, one last word on the share phase. Seth Godin calls this shipping. In Lynchpin, Godin asks, is shipping that important? He then answers, I think it is. We give in to the fear, and our art ends up lying in a box somewhere, unseen. We believe that seeking and finding an authentic audience for your work can create a transcendent learning experience. Shipping your portfolio to the world means committing to this idea. Ship it out the door. You have responsibilities in short to use your talents for the benefit of the society which helped develop those talents. The educated citizen has an obligation to serve the public. He may be a precinct worker or president, but he must be a participant and not a spectator. And therefore, the educated citizen has a special obligation to encourage the pursuit of learning. You will have the unequal satisfaction of knowing that your character and talent are contributing to the direction and success of this free society.